that. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here to uh, stay home with Leica uh, and our Noctilux discussion with fine art photographer and fashion photographer uh, Mark DiPaolo. Uh, we, I, let me see, actually, Mark's CV is so long that I uh, may actually need to read it. Give me one second here. Uh, I'm still it's showing. A whole bunch of stuff. Whole bunch of stuff. Look, you know what? I'm just going to read it. Mark DePaulo is a New York based because I, I don't want to not do it justice. Uh, you're a New York based photographer, uh, fine art fashion photographer who has shot countless campaigns and editorials for the likes of Vogue, Gucci, Donna Karen, Oscar de la Renta, just to name a few. And uh, you've directed more than 700 television commercials, including one for Anheuser Busch that aired on the Super Bowl. Uh, we just saw, those of you who are signing in, you just saw. Uh, a video that Mark produced uh, with an Octolux lens shot uh, for Leica camera. Uh, you've, your clients included Ford, uh, Giorgio Red Perfume, uh, which was exhibited in the Bordorf uh, Bordorf uh, windows and at MoMA. And uh, your fine artwork, which we'll talk about at the end of our discussion today, has been exhibited worldwide, is the collection of both public and, and private uh, collections and your most current monographs, current work, recent work, and uh, recent work too, are included in the permanent collections at the Getty and MoMA. Uh, it is absolutely a, a pleasure for to have you with us today, uh, Mark. Thanks for taking the time. Um, of course. Go back to sharing the screen here. This is uh, Leica's uh, and the Leica Academy's outreach to all of us that at this time are at home. And it, uh, it's a chance for us to nurture people's creativity, hopefully provide you a bit of information. And if we're really lucky, uh, and I'm sure it will happen today with Mark's work, uh, inspired to look at your photography in a new way. Uh, uh, it's an interactive program. So there's a chat window and I'm being helped on the uh, behind the scenes by Leica's account or account uh, Leica's product specialist Antonio Di Benedetto will be monitoring your questions and, for Mark, and we'll check in with him at the 30-minute mark and see if we can answer some questions for you all. But say hi to us. Let us know if you are brand new to the Leica Academy. Uh, if you've never experienced a program uh, with us before, uh, I we like things to be a combination of technical and creative inspiration. And we will ask all of you to share your thoughts and your images, especially if you already own an Octolux, share your images with us uh, through Instagram and on Facebook by tagging Leica Camera USA, Leica Academy USA, and Mark DiPaolo. Uh, and a hashtag of stay home with Leica will let us know uh, what you're up to in this time when a lot of us are, are inside. Uh, That's a great idea. So Mark, you have people share their share their work on the on this forum. That's great. Definitely, I we're gonna our agenda for for our talk here. We're gonna talk about your approach, and I'm really looking forward to, to learning a bit more about the behind the scenes about pictures you've made and your your approach. Uh, and we're also gonna get technical about looking at Noctilux and some of your feelings about the different variations of the Noctilux lens. Yeah and talk about some techniques and shooting. And in the end, look at uh, your work and uh, the, the arc of your work uh, and style and development of that. But I'd be remiss if I, at the beginning, assumed that everybody knows what the Noctilux is. Uh, Leica's been making lenses for over 100 years and it's possible that you may not be familiar with all of the terms. Uh, and you may have heard some of these terms, uh, Sumalux, Sumerit, and Noctilux. Well, today we're going to be talking about the Noctilux family, which is a combination of the word uh, uh, noc uh, nocturnal and light. And that's an indication, if you're not familiar with it, these lenses were designed uh, for photographers shooting in low light. Um, they, they have, as Mark will show us, a wide um, very versatile ways they can they can be used for different results but primarily that's the way that they were initially intended to be some of the fastest lenses available uh, starting in 1966 on up uh, to our most current lenses and we'll get back to talking the nuances of these lenses in just a moment but I don't want to keep Mark waiting and so Mark let me ask you I'm curious 
I don't want to bring back any bad memories, but can you tell us a little bit of how you got started with photography? Yeah, of course. Uh, that, this uh, uh, depicts great memories, uh, with the exception of one, uh, which is a great story. But that's the Bethesda Fountain uh, here in New York City um, in Central Park, uh, right near the Boat Lake, where you can rent a rowboat and uh, sort of cruise around the lake on uh, days that are uh, suited for that. Um, it's it's uh, where, you know, at my start, basically, um, photographing uh, what I call the youth culture at that time. I started about 12 years old. I would go out on the weekends to photograph the, the youth cultures and the goings on, the music. And um, it was really an amazing thing for me to view uh, that culture as a, a young boy, uh, you know, growing up. And my uh, stepfather uh, around this time had taken a, a business trip to uh, Tokyo and brought back uh, a Nikon uh, with a couple lenses. And that was sort of like the pro camera at that time. Um, the the uh, Leica the rangefinders were used for journalism, and then these now these uh, SLRs with longer lenses were uh, sort of taking over the market. And so I thought I was this hotshot pro photographer, twelve year old guy in New York. And um, uh, one day uh, it started to rain, and uh, everyone sort of scattered. And I was walking uh, through the park to get home through an area called the Ramble. Uh, quite a different city at that time, quite dangerous, and the Ramble in particular quite dangerous. And I was stopped by uh, a man, a grown man in front of me, and he uh, said, uh, stop, I'm a policeman. And I won't use the exact parlance, but uh, being sort of a cocky New York kid, I said, F you, and uh, he pulled out a gun and said, this makes me a policeman. And um, he said, go get in the bushes and, and take off your shoes. And I thought, okay, now this is getting really weird. And uh, he proceeded to, you know, take my bag and he pointed to three people behind him that came out from behind trees consecutively. And he said, uh, I'm going to leave and you're going to wait 20 minutes and these guys are going to wait 20 minutes and then they're going to follow you home. And I will know where you live. And if you ever tell anybody about this, I will come and kill you. All this time with a gun to my head, you know, mind you, I'm 12 years old. Okay, I'm still here. I, I see the grimaces uh, normally in a live audience. Um, I see the grimaces and I say, well, I'm still here, so we're okay. Um, but it was quite a, a, a significant uh, event, as you might imagine. Um, I, uh, one, uh, I didn't have a camera any longer. And I based a lot of my self-esteem on being this, you know, hotshot photographer. My father was a very prominent photographer, and that was sort of, you know, my route at that time. But I had no camera. And I had to figure out a way to get a camera, which I did. And I, you know, did extra chores and saved some money, and I ended up buying a Leica M3. My father was always a fan of and used Leica cameras and lenses. And uh, I got an M3 with a collapsible Summicron, and, you know, I was back in business, and I go back to the park, and I realized that I had been shooting with the Nikon SLR with a 200 millimeter lens and working at that distance. That's a four time magnification. So in sociology, that would be called a passive observer. And that's what I was. But I went back to the park with the Leica uh, and, the, and the 50 millimeter Summicron. And now I have to be an active participant in sociological terms because now I'm in it. And, and the proximity is a totally different thing, where people started calling me photo boy and patting me on the head and the shoulder, take a picture of me, photo boy. This is a big change in a 12-year-old's life that was to uh, set the stage, if you will, for my entire career, which is an engagement with subject where I can actually interact with them and not sort of view from far away. Um, at, at this point, when I'm speaking live uh, in, in a room, I'll walk up close to people and you can see the, you know, you feel the difference of that dynamic. And this was to set the stage for, you know, what continues to, you know, today. And um, I, I, I remember, you know, my father, you know, holding the first Noctilux, the 1.2 uh, 50 millimeter, and the way he held it meant something to me. This is a few years earlier, but I remember he was like, this is the, you know, the Noctilux and, and it, it's amazing. He just handled it differently. He was always 
very reverent to his tools because that's just the way he was. Um, but the Noctilic sort of stuck in my mind as I, re I uh, relived these things um, as uh, something very dear to him. And so when I was able to, uh, I sa saved up once the, the Noctilux 1.0, 51.0, which was released in 1976. But there was chatter about it before that. Um, once it became available, I bought one of the first 300 1.0 50 millimeter lenses in 1976. I know it dates me. I don't care. I've earned it. I'm here. Um, this lens is the very lens I bought in 1976. Not a version, not a variant, this one. And the serial number is one of, I think it's the 293rd made in the run of, it's either 14 or 17,000 and a half uh, F1 not to lie uh, between 76 and they finished up with the uh, final 100 in 2008, uh, either concurrently or uh, right around the time uh, of the release of the 50095, which is a current uh, not amazing uh, current not to lot. But so Mark, so talk about that for a little bit. So how uh, we won't add up the years, but but, more, yeah. but but when you think about that, you've had one lens. What, what's that meant for you, creative uh, creatively? That um, what, what it goes beyond a piece of gear at that point, right? It's a a companion, um, much more than a tool. I, I, I you know I just realized. Uh, in preparing for this talk, that on May 9th, 1978, I was in Torino, Italy, at the Torino Auto Show, which is a very famous auto show in the world. But um, I, I walked out of that show to martial law. Their prior prime minister, uh, Aldo Moro, was assassinated on that day. And so while I was in the show, this news had broken and I walked out and there were tanks in the streets, bulletproof shields, those old, you know, arms, articulating arms that would come down like in the old movies, the old war movies. I, I came out to a different world. Um, and I still don't know many people who have experienced martial law. And um, this was with me then. Um, on April 26, 1986, I was shooting a fashion editorial in Portofino, Italy. I was living there at that time, shooting fashion. And we, I had got word at the hotel. I remember the image I was taking of a, a beautiful model sitting in this broad window, uh, window light coming in. And we heard that Chernobyl had uh, gone off. Um, uh, you know, another world, you know, life changing event. And, um, uh, just a few weeks ago, I was in um, Milan and heard of uh, that Milan was going to shut down and I had to leave Milan um, in order to get a midnight train to Paris, which I did, and uh, stayed there for a week and shot a couple editorials there and then returned to New York. So I almost didn't make it back to New York, not in the, you know, uh, sense of illness necessarily, but since, you know, being quarantined and stay at home and stuff, I am at home in my studio in New York, um, overlooking uh, the Hudson River. Some of you have been in here and uh, saw today a uh, fighter jet, uh, only a couple few hundred feet off the, 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 the river and a uh, gunship helicopter um, to a, 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 a changed world. This, this is, this, life, this lens chronicles my life. It, 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 you know, and I'm just realizing this when I started putting this information together and um, it, it, they're every step of the way and have, you know, a lens doesn't define a photographer. A photographer defines a lens. A, a scalpel doesn't define a surgeon. A, a basketball doesn't define Michael Jordan. Th this is about, this is the lens that is mine, I am it, it is mine. And this is an inspiration, not to do like I do, but to find who you are and do who you are and find the tools and, um, and they give you voice. They give, your, give voice to your vision. So Mark, let's use that as a launching off point. We'll go yeah. back, we can talk about gear. Uh, the the uh, yeah. listeners are demanding to see your work. And so with that idea, let's yeah. talk a little bit about 
how you discovered your style and where the Noctilux fit into that. You mentioned your dad holding the camera. So we, before we talk about your work, I, I want to just share with the audience, your, your father was a filmmaker and, and a yeah, photographer. Exactly as I, although not intended, I planned to go to law school and practice international law and got uh, deviated from that and, and uh, very happy. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, life for me and continues. And um, yeah, so my father was a photographer and then quickly, you know, a, a prominent photographer, quickly turned into commercial filmmaking. I did the same thing. I started in fashion beauty and stills. My first Vogue cover, I think it was either 24 or 27, I can't remember, you know, did very well. And then uh, was called back from living in Milan to make a commercial and it was sort of like, you know, 700 commercials later, you know, here I am and concentrating primarily on fine art. But yeah, my father, uh, you know, a true inspiration, just uh, the, the classiest guy and the nicest guy and amazing taste. And uh, I hope I have a modicum of what he had. Um, but yeah, so on the screen here, you'll see an image from 1979. And um, this is uh, an image of a, a Formula One driver, a world champion at one point, and uh, who drove for Ferrari. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be in the pits. I was just this young kid, you know, running around uh, taking these candid sort of portraits. But this gives you a feeling of, you know, how early on my style was developed and how natural it was and how aided it was by the philosophy of the Noctilux. It's about shoot, don't wait, don't focus, don't, don't delay because the world is going by as you're doing these things. Shoot first. Here's another one. This is from 1986, uh, Il Coloni in Milan. And um, you know, again, Noctilux wide open. I always shoot wide open um, I, by using NDs outside, but always shoot wide open on F1 in this case. And uh, I do no post-processing, no, co no uh, cropping, nothing up to this day. And this uh, image is, a, oh gosh, maybe a few months ago here in New York on a rain-soaked day in Soho. And you, know, you can start to see the thread through the work and how once one is able to establish their feeling about the world and how they want to tell that story, then you can uh, search through the, the tools at hand. Uh, this is part of an editorial, um, don't tell anybody, but it's for uh, like S Magazine, <laughs> June 10th. They'll probably kill me for that, but whatever. Um, this is uh, part of an editorial we shot there uh, just a few, weeks in a few weeks ago in Paris. Quite amazing under great duress of going from country to country and sort of, you know, the, the virus sort of nipping at our heels as, you know, cities and countries have been closed down and um, we were able to make this happen. Uh, so that sort of brings us quickly through the, you know, the timeline. Through the timeline. Did, but go back to the, the picture, that, that Formula One picture, because there's a bit more there I want to ask you about. Yeah. I, was this discovered, I mean, here's the question. Yeah. Did you know you had the style in, 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 yeah. what year, in this, at this point, or did, was it something you matured into, you discovered over time? I, you know, I did not know. This we, uh, Sage, my producer, and I were going through my archives at a recent trip out to LA, and this file of, I think it's 14 rolls of film, was discovered, and I had forgotten about it. I shot it, processed it, probably looked at it, went to dinner, and forgot about it for uh, however many years that is. Um, so, the, the, and what it really did was solidify this, you know, arc, because right after this, in the 80s, um, Things were very crisp, mostly medium format. You know, I would use, you know, four and five strobe heads to do very careful, critical beauty work, you know, uh, rendering, you know, flesh and jewelry and things. It was, and it drove me crazy after a while and I moved back to Milan and I took with me one camera like this, this lens and a camera like this um, and uh, only to shoot that way. And I would go to the magazine and say, Marco, how are you? I haven't seen you. What, you know, what do you want to do? And Someone I, let me know in the comments if we are still. I, 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 I said, anything I can shoot with this camera and this lens. And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, just this, no assistance, no lights, no nothing. I just want to document my work. And that developed this style in opposition to the style that prevailed before that. I mean, it, it, it goes through cycles when you're around 
as long as I am. Uh, it's not just one thing, but that style, that it, formula was the earliest uh, work that I've retained in order to tell this story. Just tell the arc, sure. So as we move into showing some examples of your work, there is a question, what camera are you holding up, Mark? What camera do you have in your, your hand uh, now? So there's a, a gear guy. It's probably, um, yeah, my friend Pierre. I, I would just guess uh, that they want, he wants to know what this is. Uh, this is a, a, from 1970, it's an M4 variant. It's a black paint um, M4 Leica from 1970. Uh, you know, it's like in Vietnam, you know, like these, these cameras, not this one, but I don't know, but uh, it doesn't look like it, but pretty clean. But um, yeah, this was the 1970 uh, variant of the M camera. Of course, it's film. So take us through uh, the selections here, Mark, and, and, and maybe the campaigns or uh, locations. Yeah. There's all sorts of stuff, yeah. Um, I did a series that, I gotta tell you the story because it's pretty incredible, but I did a series um, that I, I near completed, it was supposed to be completed several weeks ago in Milan during Fashion Week called Art of Backstage. I'm not trying to promote it, it's done, you know, but this was shot during that time. And this, you know, again, is about capturing the energy in the room. I, I, I'm shooting wide open. I do not care what the shutter speed is. I, I, it reflects the energy in the room. There's movement, there's blur. I do not need to see any more detail than what you see right there. And that's my approach. Um, no flash, because a flash brings you out of the room. You know, 50,000 ESO brings you out of the room because you're shooting in a 500th, a thousandth of a second. I don't want that. I don't want it stopped. It's not stopping. It's going. I want it going. So that last one was a little capture that, you know, things are happening, you know, you, get, you know quickly. Uh, she's a very famous model. This is part of an editorial um, in Milan and um, you know again the energy on the street this is a little bit more studied because I'm doing a, a, a job for a magazine and so it's not quite as reckless as I might normally be um, this is I think this is the S camera uh, with the hundred Sumicron unbelievable like uh, you know combination uh, to render a look like this and um, Go to the next one. This one is employing the uh, the micro micro M adapter. I think it's called. Uh, it's an adapter for macro work. Macro M adapter. Macro work. Uh, where you can combine it with uh, you know 35 or 50 millimeter lens, and you can get really close. It's an amazing uh, little piece of tool. It has no glass in it. It's a very simple thing. Um, this again, same thing uh, with the micro M adapter. All handheld no high ESOs, it does what it does and you capture an energy that is evident there. Good. Mark, let's do this. I'm gonna jump back just for a moment and yeah. we're gonna, we'll come back to the work. Yeah. But I know, because um, we, we've talked about this out, outside of this, this webinar, that yeah. this style is, you could be very intellectual. It's, you're not intellectual about it when you're doing it. You're very in the moment right. and, and spontaneous and, and do a lot of thinking after the fact. But, yeah. But, I have a, oh, sorry, I'm, please. But can we share, uh, I'll, I'll queue up some slides here, a yeah. bit of what you've researched and, and, and where some of the, the intellectual process comes from um, the, behind your approach uh, in terms of how people see. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up the slides to talk about that, but can you talk about how you came to that uh, discovery and, and research? Yeah, you know, I, I came across a book that I won't be able to say the title of because I always forget it, so sorry. I'll bring it up for you, I think I may have it. Yeah, it's, uh, Dr. Margaret Livingston at the Harvard Medical School has been studying the neurobiology of human sight. I, I picked up her book one day and read it cover to cover and it just all made sense to me. So there is a lot of medical now fact about how we see. And here's one thing, the, the emotional content in our human vision and uh, is in, contained in the out of focus areas of our vision. A little scary because if you take a three dimensional world and make it into two dimensions, there, vision and art, the biology of seeing Dr. Margaret Livingston, um, do, the emotional content of an image is contained in the out of focus areas. We do not see in focus across the field of vision, whether it be a print on a table or a, a vision out uh, your window. We see 
people say, oh, 50 millimeter lens, 45 millimeter, you know, uh, degrees rather of acceptance angle is normal for humans. No, we see roughly 140 degrees and, and only about 20 of which will render anything that's sharp and it has to be off in the distance. We, we Mark, what's, the, what's the exercise that you will do during workshops? I, I always, with the Thank finger, you. Remember? Thank because, you. Thank because you. I think it may be illustrative for people at home to try that. Do, just do it, everyone. There are 407 of you. Everybody right. and now, look at, focus on your finger. What's in focus? Your finger, that's it. Now, that's simple. We have our foveal vision is our center vision is detailed and it's there to know whether we see off in the distance, is that a tree or a bear? Important information. In our peripheral vision, which is largely out of focus, that is how we bond at, as infants to our parents and caregivers, the tribe. And, 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 and so and our vision is not fully developed as infants. The, there are reasons for this. And so our vision, as I carry forward, it's been, it's, it's all made sense again, because what, you know, Dr. Livingston describes is like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's what I've been doing all along. So further, like, I've got this tool in the Noctilux, and now I've got this supportive medical uh, discovery, which is, things are being discovered, you know, how binary it is, and they can track when, you know, certain... Uh, portions of the brain are triggered and um and and to know that wh whether it's emotional or not or what um <laughs> there was a, there's a, an, another book you had referenced that I, I i put on the screen here these are crazy things like I, I i can't even sleep at night thinking about this stuff dr kendall and uh my sister is a medical doctor and i you know one night get very excited and call my sister who's in california you know let's see i mean this dr kendall book reductionism in the art and brain science he goes Oh yeah, Eric was one of my professors at Columbia Medical School. So it was sort of funny, but this guy, you know, with reductionism, it, 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 so now you've got what is, uh, you know, brain science about how we perceive things. If we give all the information, we cannot employ our individuality. When you see a Pollock painting, uh, Mark Rothko or the Impressionists, there's nothing to grab onto. We, we employ uh, a thing called stereopsis, where we can define three dimensions. But if we take away information, like in a, an impressionist, impressionist painting, then we are then able to engage emotionally because we're not give, being given tangible information. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so this is, that's the opposite of what you would think. So when you've got this reductionism, that's a Rothko painting uh, on the cover there. And uh, the, he's a, a color field uh, painter by you know, definition in the art world. I'm not an art historian. Um, and wh what they do is that it, you know, the, everybody on earth has different DNA, even twins. And everybody has different experiences, nature, nurture. Dr. Kendall talks about bottom up, top down um, processing that has to do with our DNA and our experiences. You know, people are competitive out there in the world of photography or anything. I don't compete with anybody ever because I, I don't need to. They can't be me. I can't be you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, Mark. We'll, we'll uh, go another, another slide here that it yeah. seems uh, in our discussion uh, preparing for this that Leica was already on board uh, in terms of the, the lens designers were already on board with these uh, of course, ideas. Of course. And so they, they now provide things that run a range of rendition, if you will. But uh, this is a, a quote about the Thalia lenses, therefore motion pictures, and therefore what they call large format in motion pictures. Uh, images captured with the Thalia lens, like a Thalia lenses, appear to have an added depth and dimensionality, especially on large sensor cameras, because of the gradual focus fall off. We don't see focus beyond here. Rather than having even flat planes of focus across the entire frame, the Thalia lenses have a gentle transition between in and out of focus objects that is consistent with the way we see things, and yet is different from the images of most modern lenses. Thank you. Well, I'll use that as a, as a segue, and I think part of when what people talk about with Leica in terms of a Leica look, it's yep. it's beyond just shooting wide open. And yeah, I know you teach a workshop uh, called sure, Photography sure. Wide Open, which on the surface is just about the lens. It's actually also about the way you think about making pictures. Right. Uh, but I, 
I think sometimes we uh, forget uh, that it is that out of focus area that creates an emotional, um, a, a creates an emotional feeling to a lot of pictures. Engagement. And it allows for more engagement. If you, if you tell everybody all the details, there's no imagination. So the idea is to allow for people to process their own way. Don't tell them how to feel. Present something that engages you and allow them to engage. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna, you know, with that in mind, I, I, let me. Uh, we're gonna go. Let's talk a little bit more about gear before we go go back to the work, uh, sure. because there are a number of questions popping up in the chat window um, about your uh, normal setup for uh, for an assignment or and what maybe what the difference is between when you're working uh, and your personal work as far as gear. Yeah, yeah. Um, I you know it's a total blend. It always has been in making commercials and now and before. It's it's what's suited for the. Uh, the assignment or the project, um, but it always relates to the way I see and feel. So um, that image, you, I, I took this earlier today, uh, the 095 that is uh, on the uh, upper part of the frame with the, the focusing and aperture gears, that's a cinema version of the 095 not Noctilux. And like that I use for cinema a lot on the SL, SL2 and the M240 uh, because you can shoot video on the M2 point. Um, so this is, this is a monochrome, but the, you know, so this is a go-to uh, setup for me for cinema. Um, there's clickless aperture. Um, it's amazing because when you click between an f-stop, a half an f-stop and a whole f-stop, it's half the light and then a hundred percent of the light difference. On this camera, I, I, it's infinite. You know, so I can be very, very accurate splitting stops so that I don't rely on any post-processing. So I, you know, put it on the neg, as they say, of course, put it on the sensor. So um, SL, amazing uh, camera for with a, just beyond viewfinder uh, to work with these high-speed lenses. I've been doing it since I'm a kid. And so, you know, I'm pretty quick with the rangefinder and I can even follow focus with the rangefinder doing cinema stuff with the M240. But so, you know, Mark, we'll go, we're going to look at some work that'll support that. Uh, let's take yeah. a moment. I think I got a, a text from, uh, from Antonio on yeah. um, he's, uh, screening some of the questions. Antonio, yeah. can you come off mute and let us know any questions directly for Mark? Yeah, so there's a bunch of bunch of great, great questions in the chat. So I wanted to call out a few uh, just to start. Uh, here's a really simple one. Someone asked who that Formula One driver was over at the beginning. Do you, do you recall who that was, Mark? Yeah, that's um, Carlos Reutemann. Uh, Carlos Reutemann. Uh, he, he drove for Ferrari for some time. Uh, and we've got actually a few people asking questions uh, similarly about, you probably answer a few at the same time. Uh, about how difficult it is to focus a Noctilux and how, how tricky with such shallow depth of field. Um, so they're asking about some techniques that you suggest uh, to Sure, do. sure. At minimum focus, rocking into place is a good one because you can get really sort of, you know, micrometer changes if you, you know, practice that. Um, the rangefinder was designed to be quick. A, a, a red portage tool, a photojournalist tool. Focusing with the range fire is, is, is very quick, uh, more so than the searching of autofocus. They can't know what you're focusing on, but um, it, it takes time to focus. You know, so you, you learn to, you know, learn uh, the tool, uh, you know, in, in, in race car driving, it's called seat time. It's just practice, 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 practice. And the other thing is like, I had an exhibition here in New York and uh, it was um, curated by Alex, Alice Gabriner, uh, who was a, just an amazing curator. She was at Time or Newsweek magazine as the senior photo editor, and she was at the White House under Obama, head of uh, photo, all photo related things. And we were talking about my work and the sort of crazy you know, thing and then how that relates to the digital world. And I said to her, I said, Alice, I said, how much information do you need you know, do you need to render the eyelashes on the fallen soldier? Very famous Kappa, and you can look it up, a fa famous Kappa um, photograph of the incident of being, someone being shot. You know, it's like, what is the important information? So you have to first analyze what's the nature of the sharpness that you're trying to achieve, and how important is that under that circumstance? The idea is get the image first. Life is going by. Shoot. 
Sure, good. Other questions, Antonio? Maybe a couple more? Yeah, uh, a couple more. So, uh, and, and again, more on the technical side um, with, you know, where, where you're getting that focus, especially in, in tough situations, is there one particular thing you just focus on the eyes? Uh, people ask what part of the face you focus on and also how you overcome uh, trying to get these kinds of shots uh, so quickly. You know, again, it's experience and, and the idea of push the button. The, the first thing is push the button and see what you get and see that, wow, it doesn't have to be exactly as you thought it had to be. You know, sort of expand your blinders a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, you know, you know again, it's uh, lining up two elements. So, you know, I can, I, I often do in my workshops walking backwards, have the model walking to me and I'm shooting at F1 and I'm focused, manual focusing on the, the, the Noctilux, obviously. And so the idea is like, I'll go for the lips or I'll go for the eyes or if there's an important color detail and I'll just find something where there's some contrast that I can follow. And I know that, you know, turning the lens to the right is closer, turning the lens to the left is further away. That's not the case with Nikon, but it is the case with Canon. And Princeton. You gotta know your gear so that you know if the, per the model starts walking a little quicker, ah, you're gonna rack you know, to the right a little bit uh, from your camera's point of view. Mark, why don't we actually take them? You've preloaded a sequence. Uh, you set this up, a sequence in Paris that I think is a good illustration for how you're working in a, in a, a short period of time. What you're trying to say is how crazy I am. I thank you for not using that word, but I'm okay. Um, this is not planned. I, you know, this is this uh, editorial we did uh, in Paris, and it was pouring rain, and uh, I, I, I knew that I couldn't follow this model around and then have an assistant carrying the umbrella to cover me and this and that. Uh, she's a very fine uh, model uh, from Russia and a brilliant model, and I just took I grabbed for an umbrella, I put it over me, and I took, in this case, um, I believe this was the, the Summicron, not the Noctilux, but I, uh, with, with the monochrome camera. What I did was, this is, a, if you go back to the beginning, it's sort of important, and then you can go back to them quickly. This is a sequence of every frame I took of this garment. Running around, I did not ever look through the camera, I never focused, I put it on five feet, and I had the umbrella and I just followed her around. I didn't even say for her what to do. I just said, okay, here we go. And this is in sequence, not edited, not one taken out, not one, just, this is all the images, not looking through the camera, not focusing, running around after this model. And you see how this sequence is and what, need, what needs to be there in terms of detail in order to tell the story. There's beautiful architecture, you know, this is not Culver City, respectfully. Um, and we're, we're running around and she's just doing this. I'm going click, click, click. The people behind me, the support crew, hair and makeup and stylists, they're talking to Sage going like, what's he doing? Is he shooting? God, that, that's crazy. Like, what's he doing? Like, they, they had no idea. And I, it was not planned. I just figured I had to get that shot. And I'm going to go and do it without ruining the camera. In the background is the Louvre, which was later closed to public. This is like literally the coronavirus, like right behind us, sort of. Um, but this is all in sequence, every single image of that garment. And I, you know, I question you, like, what, what more do you need to know? It's a, it's a white garment, and it's in the rain, and it's Paris, and there you go. So in, in a moment, uh, Mark, we're going to talk a bit more about your transition to, to fine artwork. But while we're looking at this sequence, I'm interested what we, we've had some comments about the editing. Does he crop and, and, and uh, you know, you're shooting base ISO, you're shooting uh, the, the DNG file and processing and getting it out. But, but how is that different? How is your process different uh, with this work versus your fine artwork? Same. In terms of time and approach. Same. Same. I shoot DNG plus JPEG. And I uh, often, if I'm not going to print, I use the JPEG. Anything online or, you know, distributed that way. When we go to print, you have to profile for printing. So we go to the DNG. But we follow the JPEG because well, I put it on the neg, as I say. So it's on the sensor. These are all images directly off the monochrome, the 246. The, the, the new one hadn't come out yet, or I, I didn't get it yet. I mean, I don't have it yet. But um, so... Yeah, so no post, no cropping, 
DNG plus JPEG, use the JPEG. Well, we're gonna we're, we're gonna be bring up. Uh, Mark, uh, I got a good question actually oh, yeah, that, yeah. that uh, goes well, synergizes really well with this. Um, so with these kinds of shots, you say how the the, the people are that are for the magazine that they kind of are like, what's, what's he doing? Um, do you encounter that a lot where maybe like the magazine editors or art directors, do they, do they conflict sometimes with um, your style and, and how do you overcome that when you do? Do you have to just work with people that you know well and you gel well with or how, how do you channel, time, overcome that challenge? At that time, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. Someone had come back, come up to me backstage during a, a fashion show, and they said to me, "Like, well, wow, I love your work, and I, I, I uh, we'd love to have you work with us. We are so and so. You know, who we are. of course, I know who you are. You know, uh, yeah. So we really love to have you uh, work for us, and you know, but, but maybe you can just do a few more in focus and." I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I thought you knew my work. And they were, no, no, I love, we love your work, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, no, I don't think that's a good fit. And they were like, what? I said, well, I can't really be told when to do something in focus and when not. I, I can shoot every picture, every image in focus. That's not a problem. It's just that I choose not to and that the results and the benefit of my work are that it's a, loose, a looseness and it's in the environment and it's real and it's alive. And so I, I don't think... It's it's a good fit. And I said, well, we have 8,000 venues around the world. I said, well, no, I, I know who you are. I just said, I, I'm going to have to uh, respectfully, you know, pass on this. And they were, you know, didn't understand how I could do that. And one comes from, you know, being stupid um, because I, uh, I, I place emphasis on the integrity of the work. And I, I, I work very hard and I, I'm not trying to amass riches. So it's not like, whoa, I'm gonna work with them and just do what they want. I made commercials for 20 years, basically I say with a gun to my head, uh, you know, very big dollar commercials and, you know, sort of, uh, I, I did everything that they wanted and then what I would do at the end, I'd say to them, look, I'm gonna do what the storyboard says and at the end, I'm gonna do what I would like to do just for your consideration. And so when people ask me, especially under the circumstances, if they're newer, younger art directors, you know, or something, and they're, you know, getting a little uptight during the shoot, I say, look, at the end of the shoot, you're going to have every single thing you ask for and more. So you can choose to be nervous as, as you want now, but at the end of the day, you're going to have all that you want and more. So let me get back to it. So it's sort of like, you know, staying strong to it's hard for a 25 year old photographer you know who's living with six people in brooklyn and you know to turn down work i am not a wealthy person but very wealthy in spirit and determination to do my best work and so i think it comes from a mindset and also you know experience time you know time gives you you know some chutzpah you know it, it, uh, mark if you'll allow me one of the things that I want to note is that you are uh, a very driven photographer. You are uh, very prolific and uh, constantly um, shooting. I, anytime I've ever spent time around you, you've got the camera and, and you're shooting. And can you, I want to use that as a way to introduce your fine artwork and, and specifically the story of uh, how you came to the 60 Seconds Project. Yeah, crazy. Um, I I've been asked a lot of times to do a book and gallery exhibitions and this and that. And I was like, you know, my art's in my work. I'm good. You know, thank you so much. I'm flattered. Um, I picked up a camera in the middle of the night one night at uh, my studio prior to this one a few blocks away. Um, and it was uh, dark, completely dark. And uh, only the ambience that was coming in from the windows uh, with, you know, no direct street lights or anything was on the eighth floor. Um, and I uh, just pushed the button. Uh, it was an M240 and um, it started flashing 60 seconds. I could, and I just didn't know what that was. And I just sort of, you know, held my breath because uh, I could either put it down or I could hold it. So for 60 seconds, it went and counted down and then it buffered for 60 seconds more, which was an eternity. And I saw an image, I think it was this one or very close to this one that came up and it just blew my mind. Literally, it was like, immediately wow that's art to me right that's art and these are still like i see these it's like oh my god it's like you know so moving and let me tell you a little story about this to see color you have to employ uh different types of uh, photoreceptors in your eye to see color you need to employ the cones the rods 
Those are the two types of receptors. The rods only give you monochrome information. It's under low light situation. The cones will give you color information. While shooting these, I could see no color. I could basically see nothing. And they were largely shot with the, the Noctilux, the M240, and at 60 seconds, all of them. And I never focused. I couldn't even see anything to focus on. I shot this for eight months in the middle of the night. And that became that series. Uh, I believe that a series has to end before it is a series. It can't go on forever. Um, so so that's just for me, and I, I don't know why, but uh, it doesn't have to be that. But um, So that's how we came about it. Then I started showing some people who I say, you know, are smart in the art world, and they were just, you know, minds being blown. And, you know, this is not out of ego. It, really, it's not. Um, I'm very uh, self-contained with my assessment of my work. I, I, I don't need those type of accolades. But they, they were really like, wow, this has never been done before, and blah, blah, blah. So thus, this uh, series uh, has gone around the world, and it's done very well. And, uh, collected in many, many places. And I'm, it, what's most important is I'm particularly proud of it. And that started my art. And so it went from 60 seconds to the art of backstage and is now in recent work. Um, and recent work is, a, you know, again, because I'm into this neurobiology and this, you know, cognitive psychology, I'm shooting now from a feeling, not from vast experience or expertise. When I feel something, I shoot it. I don't ask questions. I don't intellectualize it. And that is different than going and saying, wow, that's Mount Fuji. I'm going to take a picture of that. You can't miss with that. What I'm doing is like going around the world and just taking pictures of stuff that just like this one on the right side of your screen. I was in the middle night of, in Milan and it just was a reflection or something. You know, like it just gave me a feeling. I still don't know what it is, but take the picture. The idea is take the picture. Uh, wow, this is sort of scary for me because this gave me a really strong, really strong feeling. Uh, this is in, in Hempstead Heath uh, in uh, outside of London, North London. And I was the people I was with, I said, wow, this place has just like got so much going on. And like, I'm not like really a pretty basic New Yorker, but um, I would, you know, I'm, I'm so in tune to just feeling something now. And so I said, wow, this is just crazy. They said, yeah, this is uh, uh, Hempstead Heath. The Heath is where uh, the people from London escaped the plague and would come up to escape the plague. Okay. Um, and, you know, here I am and here we are, you know, trying to escape, if that's a good word. I don't know what's politically correct, but I don't think anybody wants uh, what's going around. But uh, uh, so. Mark, I'm going to take. I want to bring us up to. There's a number of questions uh, yeah. and leave us a little bit of time for question and answer here at the end. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things that people are asking. Oh, I hit share too soon. There we go. Is this question, yeah. uh, which I know you have some pictures loaded up for, about what's happening now? What is the latest product? Not latest latest project, but what's the latest version of recent work? Recent work three. But there are two. Uh, it's a three part series in the form of a book. Uh, recent work one and two have been already released. Uh, three comes out in Paris in the fall, if we have the schedule to do that. So these are just more recent work. Um, you know, stuff that appeals to me as a, emotionally, not just, wow, that's a great picture. This is a good example of it in Paris. This is not your typical uh, rendition of the Seine River, but it was, for me, what caught my eye. This. I don't know what this medieval thing is, but that's also in Paris. And it was just like, oh, okay, so pigeons don't go and, you know, hurt yourself over there. <laughs> I don't know what it's for. Uh, this is uh, actually the Flatiron Building uh, in a pond reflected uh, here in New York City. You know, just stuff that I'm feeling, you know, uh, connecting with a person, uh, a friend of mine, Siri, uh, she's just magic. And, uh, you know, stuff, this I photographed, in the side view mirror of a truck on the street in Soho of the model, you know, touching up her makeup before we did some close up work for the Prada stuff. And it was just like, I'm looking in the side view mirror of a, of a truck, you know? Um, so it, it's very, just shoot, push the button, you know? Um, so they, they, that begs the question, you know, we, we all, at least uh, for the time being, are uh, out of a con greater concern for, for everyone, uh, staying to ourselves. But then what are you doing creatively to keep yourself uh, active? Yeah, I'm, you know, again, you, you know, uh, I, uh, in the studio, 
video. I'm doing a lot of macro stuff because I've just got some time to be able to do that. Um, and I'm also doing some remote work. And I'm not going to say how I do it and, um, because it's still a very active and uh, I, I don't know it's been explored this way, but it's my rendition of remote. And I really love it because it's really interesting color and also black and white, it looks like, you know, sort of, you know, Steichen or Stieglitz or, you know, these old masters uh, nudes, uh, just the way it renders things not in tack sharp focus. And uh, yeah, so that actually, I'm, I'm working on uh, with a magazine now that we might uh, expose this fairly soon. So you'll see it. Or if maybe Tom twists my arm at some point, I might, you know, do it in this forum. But uh, yeah. Okay. So this is stuff that I, I can't say exactly how it's done, but um, I, I'm really enjoying it. I think, let's see, using this as a, a launching off point, this, this quote, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark, um, we are inundated with imagery. And you know, our audience right now, we've got a variety of uh, experience levels in terms of photography. And to bring us to a, to a conclusion and uh, yeah. maybe let people know how they can stay in touch with us, what would be, you know, in a time when, you know, like I say, we're inundated with images and we're always looking at, at Instagram. What, what is your guidance to photographers to uh, figure out how to stand out? Well, you know, it, you have to be brave and it, it comes from inside you. There's no formula. It's what is it that your uh, uh, vision is? What, what story are you telling? Because if you spend all your time on Instagram scrolling or even going through books, you are reconditioning your memory. Your memory is responsible for vision. This is another thing. Your eyes don't see. Everything is just, uh, it's a receptor so that it goes to the proper part of the brain, then it becomes memory, and then it becomes how you see things. There are no facts or illusions as it relates to vision. We all see differently. I'm very sorry. We want commonality. We want, you know, community, but we are all distinctly different. So it's finding what it is that you like without rewiring by inundating your own visual system to rewire to be what everybody else is doing. And that's what people are doing, very unfortunately, because then it becomes, you know, a standard that is you know, like I always say, like, you know, everyone's swimming in the same pool. I want to swim in my own pool. And, and this is very important. Be brave to tell your story and, and be brave enough to, to say it because we insulate ourselves because we don't want to be hurt and we want to have a community, but we don't want to be vulnerable. But in order to really get in touch with yourself, you do have to be somewhat vulnerable. And, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a filmmaker and a photographer, but I love this process. But it does leave you open, more raw, open to things because in the pursuit of imagery in your story, you have to be open. So it's like, you know, it's a little bit difficult, you know. So for the, the gear people who didn't quite get all of the um, nuances of the Noctilux that they were hoping for, I, I, you've got a list of uh, four Noctiluxes up there. Can yep. you uh, give us, uh, I'm gonna drill you down here. If you had to only have one, you can't have all four. You can only have one. What's the one that you're going to take out? To the, first, the first one that's on there. And why? The 1.2. Uh, okay. Uh, it's the rendering again. It's not, I, I'm not in that, you know, wow, I have a Leica, I have a Noctilux, like, um, you know, I'm badass. Uh, I, I've been working with these things forever. Uh, that lens is uh, a lens that was designed employing uh, for the first time commercially available hand ground aspherical optics. There were two hand ground uh, aspherical elements in order to correct what they were going for. I'm not gonna go into optical physics but, or design, but um, so the 1.2, uh, you know, and, and it was measured in microns. And then you have to get into the engineering of how they align those, how they collimate those in the focusing helical. It's, uh, you know, people say, oh, they're 2,000, oh, they're 1,000. I mean, if there were 500 of those made, I'd be surprised. Very high failure rate thrown into the bin, literally. They, they just couldn't get it right that frequently and they stopped making it. They say from 66 to 75, not a, a chance. <laughs> they were made for a couple of years and very few compared to what's out there. Um, the 50 F1 has been my lens forever. It's still sitting here. Um, it, that's no aspherics, but uh, using advanced glass, it's amazing because 
This is uh, zirconium oxide, high levels of the zirconium oxide in the formulation of the glass for the Noctilux F1. Uh, they have to heat that to 1600 degrees Celsius, which is a right under 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. It has to cool and they have to use uh, platinum crucibles and, and, and tools uh, because of the high rate of heat. Um, and so that there isn't, you know, molecular migration, you know, during the process. They have to cool for weeks or maybe even months in order to make that glass, an octoglux glass. Um, and um, it, 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 so, you know, therefore very special. Um, but you know what, I, you, there's all, we packed a great deal of information both, yeah. uh, from a creative standpoint yeah. and technical into uh, our, our hour that went by incredibly quickly. Yeah. But, I, uh, all of the information. Can I, can, can I have 30 seconds, Tom? Can I interrupt you for 30 seconds? Absolutely, yeah, go okay. for it. I want to thank you for all your hard work. I want to thank the Academy, you know, Phil, uh, Like a Camera USA, Roland, Kieran, Yvette. And I want to thank especially Like a Camera, um, uh, Dr. Kaufman for his vision and innovation. All these things combined to providing the things that we love in order for our, to be, to tell our story. In, in a very unique way. So thank you all for coming, but go ahead. Mark, thank you. I, and, and, you know, we're gonna continue this Stay yeah. Home with Leica series uh, over the next several weeks. And uh, most of those uh, programs, actually, if you check the uh, Leica Academy website or the Leica Academy Instagram feed, you'll find a link and you can find out about upcoming programs. But to wrap mm -hmm. us up here, I wanna also point out that for a limited time, if you would like to contact uh, us at the Academy, uh, we can arrange uh, some bespoke sessions that are not something that Mark typically offers. We're gonna be offering those here in April. Uh, we also are planning in August August, a on-location workshop. It's going to be limited to 10 people and that will soon be posted and planning very far in advance. I forget how many people we're doing this for. I think it's for like six, six or eight, eight or something. Eight. Yeah, no more than eight people. We're going to do a destination uh, personal vision and travel uh, experience in uh, Porto, Portugal uh, in 2021. Also visiting the Leica factory, which no one gets to do. Absolutely. We're, we're uh, lucky to be able to do that. And there's a one more, we'll get some contact information up here for, for you all. Uh, Mark put together a handout that is a follow-up uh, of a lot of the details and a lot of technical information on the lenses that we discussed. And you can reach out to uh, Mark at the website you see there on the screen. And you can reach uh, me directly at the Academy at Like a Camera USA if you have any other uh, questions on this or any of the programs we offer. I can't thank you enough, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, thank and you thank for the you opportunity. All. Thank you all for, for listening. This is just the beginning. Everybody stay well.